This is Kathy Knipfer, instructor for Nursing 2203, recording the pediatric lecture for Chapter 28 entitled Developmental and Genetic Influences on Child Health Promotion. Growth and development is a dynamic process. Growth is considered an increase in number and size of cells as they divide and synthesize new proteins. Growth results in increased size and weight of the whole or any of its parts. Development is a gradual change in expansion. It's considered an advancement from lower to more advanced stages of complexity and encompasses an increased capacity through growth, maturation, and learning. Maturation is an increase in competence and adaptability. As the individual matures, it's described as a qualitative change and the individual functions at a higher level. With differentiation, the process is that early cells and structures are systematically modified and altered. There are several patterns of growth and development. There are directional trends that include cephalocaudal, which would be head to toe, proximodistal, near to far, and differentiation, which describes development from simple operations to more complex activities and functions. There are also sequential trends where the sequences are predictable, such as when a child crawls before they creep or they creep before they stand, and then there is a developmental pace where not all areas of development occur at the same pace. And this could be applied to gross motor skills, fine motor skills, language and social skills. Then there are also sensitive periods such as the first three prenatal months. And then there are those differences that where individuals are unique. Biologic growth and physical development. With external proportions, some tissues and organs grow faster than others during different periods, such as when the head grows faster during fetal development. Biologic determinants of growth have to do with height and weight. Skeletal growth and maturation is the most accurate measure of general development. Neurologic maturation is increased in the prenatal period and during infancy. Lymphoid tissue increases rapidly to age 12, then it declines. Organ systems also undergo changes. Some are very subtle and some are very striking. There are physiologic changes that occur during childhood. They include metabolism. The basal metabolic rate is higher in infants based on the body surface area in relation to the body weight. With temperature, thermal regulation is important 
as the infant adapts during the transition to extrauterine life. Sleep and rest have a protective function. Sleep and rest allows for tissue repair and recovery after activity. Infants and young children are very susceptible to temperature fluctuations. Nutrition is the single most important influence on growth. What is the definition of temperament? It's the manner of thinking or behaving or reacting that is characteristic of an individual. So we have the easy child who's even-tempered, has a positive attitude toward new stimuli, and they're open and adaptable. That accounts for approximately 40%. The difficult child is highly active, irritable, and has irregular habits. This child requires structure, and adapt slowly to new routines, people, situations. There may be frequent periods of crying or violent tantrums. That accounts for 10%. And then the slow to warm up child reacts negatively to new stimuli, adapts slowly with repeated contact, responds with mild or passive resistance to new routines, and is moderately irregular in function. This accounts for 15%. The rest, which is 35%, are inconsistent and do not display all behaviors in a category. So there may be a blend. Theoretic Foundations of Personality Development Freud was responsible for the psychosocial development theory. There's the oral stage, which is birth to one year. The source of pleasure is through oral activities such as sucking, chewing, biting, or vocalizing. The anal stage from one to three years is focused on the anal sphincter and the ability to control bowel movements. The climate during toilet training affects the individual personality. The phallic stage is from three to six years. The focus is on the genitalia. Individuals are curious about differences between boys and girls. It involves penis en envy and castration anxiety. The latency period from 6 to 12 years, the individual elaborates on previous skills and traits. With the genital stage, which is 12 years and older, the genital organs become a source of tension or pleasure. Friendships form and they prepare for marriage. Erickson's theory of psychosocial development involves several stages. Trust versus mistrust, which is birth to one year. During this stage, loving care by a mothering person is essential and basic needs must consistently be met. The second stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt, which is ages one to three years. The individual needs to do things for themselves through walking, climbing, decision making, and they need to be praised for successes. The third stage is initiative versus guilt, which is three to six years. During this period, they develop a conscience and an inner voice. They take the initiative to explore the physical world, and if they're made to feel that activities are bad, guilt is created. Successful passage through this stage results in a sense of direction and purpose. The fourth stage is industry versus inferiority, 6 to 12 years. The individual carries out tasks and responsibilities to completion, but too many expectations may lead to feelings of inferiority. Then there's the stage identity, identity versus role confusion, which is 12 to 18 years. During this period, they're preoccupied with appearance, role development, values are integrated with those of society, and they may select an occupation. Piaget's theory of cognitive development involves sensory motor, which is birth to two years. This involves simple learning that takes place. Uh, behavior is directed toward objects. There's a sense of cause and effect. The individual is curious and they form a sense of self as separate from the environment. The pre-operational phase 
is ages two to seven years. It involves egocentrism. They cannot put oneself in the place of another. It involves imaginative play, questioning, and they begin to make simple associations in ideas. Concrete operations for ages 7 to 11. The individual solves problems in a concrete manner. They can classify, they can sort, organize facts, they consider points of view of others, and reasoning is inductive. With formal operations, which are ages 11 to 15 years, this period is characterized by adaptability and flexibility, and they can think in abstract terms. Language development. We are all born with the mechanism and capacity to develop speech and language skills. We start with gestures, and then speech follows gestures. We need an environment that's conducive to language development. We need an intact physiologic structure and function. We need intelligence and a need to communicate. We also need stimulation. There's also a theory of moral development by Kohlberg. At the preconventional level, the individual determines goodness or badness of a behavior based on the consequences of the behavior. At the conventional level, the individual values maintenance of expectations regardless of the consequences. They're focused on loyalty and conformity, and behavior that pleases or helps is good. Post-conventional, autonomous, or principled level, the correct behavior is defined by general individual rights and societal standards. And then the most advanced moral development, the individual chooses ethical principles to guide decisions of conscience. Very few reach this advanced stage. With Fowler's theory of spiritual development. At stage zero, it's undifferentiated. There's no concept of right or wrong, no beliefs, but they begin to, to develop faith and trust. At stage one, the intuitive projective stage, toddlers imitate behavior of others. Preschoolers assimilate some parental beliefs of good and bad. They imitate parental behaviors without understanding the underlying concepts. With stage two, the mythical literal stage, the school-age child will have a strong interest in religion and accept the existence of a deity. They maintain that good behavior is rewarded and bad behavior is punished, and they expect prayers to be answered. With stage three, the synthetic convention stage, they become aware of spiritual disappointments and that prayers might not be answered, and they question parental religious standards. At stage four, the individuating reflexive stage, adolescents become skeptical. They compare parental religion to that of others and develop their own set of religious values. With Fowler's theory of spiritual development, at stage zero, it's undifferentiated. There's no concept of right or wrong, no belief, but they begin to develop faith or trust. At stage one, that's the intuitive or projective stage. Toddlers will imitate behavior of others. Preschoolers assimilate some parental beliefs of good and bad. They imitate parental behaviors without understanding the underlying concepts. At stage two, that's the mythical literal stage. School-age children have a strong interest in religion and accept the existence of a deity. Good behavior is rewarded. Bad behavior is punished, and they expect prayers to be answered. At stage three, the synthetic or convention stage, the individual becomes aware of spiritual disappointments and that prayers might not be answered. They question parental religious standards. At stage four, the individuating reflexive stage, 
Adolescents become skeptical. They compare their parental religion to that of others. They develop a their own set of religious values. Development of self-concept. The definition of body image consists of physiologic, psychologic, and social nature of one's own body. When we assess our self-esteem, we ask questions like, how adequate are my cognitive, physical, and social skills? That would determine competence. We might ask, how well can I complete tasks needed to produce desired actions? Is someone or something specific versus luck or chance responsible for my successes or failures. That's our sense of control. And then with moral worth, we ask, how closely do my actions and behaviors meet established moral standards? When we assess whether we're worthy of love and acceptance, we ask, how worthy am I of love and acceptance? For example, parents, siblings, peers, and other significant adults. Play can be classified based on content and social character. Social effective play would be when infants take pleasure in relationships with people, such as cooing or smiling. Since pleasure play, objects attract the child's attention. Things like light, texture, rocking, taste, handling raw materials such as water or sand or even smelling. Skill play occurs after infants develop grasping and manipulation skills, and then they repeat that action. Unoccupied behaviors such as daydreaming, walking aimlessly, and just focusing on anything that attracts their attention. Dramatic and pretend play begins in late infancy and predominates with preschool children. Pretend roles are involved in this type of play. Games begin with simple games in young children. They may be alone or with others throughout the stages. This is an excellent example of sense pleasure play. This is a good example of skill play. You might keep in mind that this child is probably placing things in underneath the seat of the little car, taking them out, and then repeating that action. Now let's talk about the social character of play. There is onlooker play, where the child watches play, but they don't attempt to participate. There's solitary play, where they play alone with different toys. They enjoy the presence of others, but they don't play with the others. Parallel play is where they play with similar toys alongside others, but they don't influence each other. Associative play they play together, but there's no organization or common goal. And then the last one is cooperative play. They play in an organized manner. They have a common goal. Leader-follower relationships develop, and the leader defines the roles of the participants.
Here's an example of parallel play. One tool that is used in developmental assessment is the Ages and Stages Questionnaire. It's completed by parents for children who are one month to five and a half years of age. Uh, it includes questions about developmental skills that their child demonstrates in daily life. If the results are significantly below those for other children of the same age, further evaluation is recommended. This is an example of associative play. Here we see an example of cooperative play. Play has many functions. It helps with sensory motor development. It promotes muscle development and it's good for release of energy. It also promotes intellectual development. For example, when a child learns numbers or associates words with objects, understands spatial relationships, and begins problem solving. It also helps with socialization. Children learn to give and take. They learn right from wrong and they become responsible for actions. It encourages creativity. Pressuring towards conformity stifles creativity. So we want to encourage children to try new ideas, like with crafts or paints. It encourages self-awareness. So the child becomes aware of themselves as separate from their mother, and they become aware of their effect on others. It has therapeutic value. Children can communicate needs, fears, desires. They can express emotions and release unacceptable impulses. It also encourages morality because peers enforce codes of behavior. You can tell that play is therapeutic for this child.
toys are important in play. They can support and enhance children's development. They offer an, an opportunity to bring children and parents together. Pushing, pulling, rolling, and manipulating help develop muscles. Toys also help to develop cooperation in organizations, such as when a child plays with board games. Genetic factors can influence development, such as congenital anomalies, disorders of the intrauterine environment, or genetic disorders. The nurse can play a role in genetics. They can make an assessment, apply genetic knowledge when they do make this assessment. They can identify, make referrals, and they can educate.